Thanks for stopping by. This is Dan Bell with Bell Certified. Today we'll be speaking about 35 USC 102E. It has some similarities with uh, last week's topic, 35 USC 102A, but also has some differences. Uh, you may recall that in 102A uh, we were looking for a uh, two of the types of uh, prior art were patent applications um, that had published and uh, patents that had issued um, and the 102A date on those was was the date that they were accessible um, meaning for an issued patent that's the day it issued it was useful as prior art under 102A or for a patent application it was useful as uh, prior art uh, on the day it publishes and becomes accessible. Um, 102 E provides uh, an additional benefit which is that you're entitled to the earlier filing date of the reference as a prior art date. And so that's often earlier because a reference uh, that's filed on this date often doesn't publish uh, for 18 months typically and it often doesn't issue for even a longer period of time so uh, under 102A we would have been entitled to this later uh, publication date or issue date and what 102E does is it allows us to get back to the to the filing date of the so the of the reference and that's a US filing date so that so the the benefit is this additional time from when it when it issues uh, all the way back to its filing date. So just to start in the same place, and for comparison purposes, your lawyer gives you a target patent that they want researched. They tell you claim one um, to research. Your app your uh, patent has a filing date that you're aware of, uh, but you don't know the day of invention. You're told that 102E is okay, um, and since you've taken this course, uh, you, you know what 102E is, and you go out and you look for 102E references of two types. Uh, one type you can find is a uh, an application filed in the U.S. Uh, before the invention date. And the other type is a patent, granted, that was filed in the U.S. before the invention date. So again, the publication can or issue date or grant of the patent can occur at any time, so long as the uh, the filing date is before the invention date. So here's your target. You go out and you find a reference that's six months before the presumed constructive reduction to practice state that we talked about. And let's take two examples. Let's say um, one example is this is a um, an application. So you, you present this application, um, this first example, this 102E1 example. You present this application, you say, look, this application was filed six months before our constructive reduction date. So it was an application published, later published. It was by another, and it was filed in the U.S. before the invention by the applicant. Well, we don't know what the invention date is, uh, but we presume it to be the filing date of this target. Um, and... Um, so we're six months before that. Yeah, the, the reference teaches each and every element of claim one. And the lawyer, we hand that back to the lawyer. They're really excited. They give it to the other side. The other side says the same thing we learned last week. Hey, wait a second. We've looked at it. And our target, this target patent, it's true that our presumed, file, our presumed invention date was this constructive reduction to practice, which was the filing date. But we contacted the inventors, and we found out that we have conception before your 
uh, filing date on the reference you found, which is the, the prior art event. Before this prior art event, we had conception. We checked into it further, and it turns out diligence started before that prior art event date, and it continued all the way until either our constructive reduction date or maybe before we, we had a model. And since diligence continued from before the event prior art event date through to w either a actual reduction in practice or constructive reduction in practice, this reference is not prior art. And similarly with a patent, if, we, if it were a patent filed, this is the number two example, in the U.S. before, issued at any time, can issue here, can issue here, can issue after the constructive, as long as it's filed before, uh, and therefore it's a number two example issued at some point. And again, we pass that back. The other side says, wait a second, we checked into it. We had conception before this prior out event, and our diligence uh, started uh, prior to the event and continued until uh, we either had a constructive reduction practice or an actual reduction practice, and therefore this is not prior art. If they can't prove that, if they uh, if they can't beat your date, then, then it is prior art. And... Um, uh, that's where this stands. Now, um, in most examples, this uh, notice this by another applies to um, both exa the application uh, example and the granted patent example. It has to be by another. Well, what is uh, by another? We've talked about that. That's the inventive entity theory. So if if um, let me open up a new window quickly here. Go ahead and save this. So it has to be by another. So here's the target. Oops. Boy. I am going to win this award here, aren't I? So let's say this target is invented by A, and they f the reference that you find, the prior, re prior art reference is invented by B. This is by another, right? And so that qualifies under 102E. Uh, e. What if uh, a lot of the reading materials uh, are talking about another example where you have a, your target is invented by A, and the reference that you find, which is filed in the U.S. before, is invented by A and B. Where, in other words, A is overlapping. You have A in both these, right? Um, uh, technically, that's that's by another, uh, at least presumptively. Um, that's prior art by another, presumptively. Uh, and as long as it teaches each and every element of the claim. A is here, A is here, A is in the reference, A is in the target. Um, but what the court will do in that case is it will look at the language in here, in the reference, that's teaching claim one. And it'll say, look, if, if A contributed this knowledge in the prior, quote, prior art by another because B would, had joined them, then that's not really prior art. That's not by another in that case because it's just the, the part being claimed over here, claim one, was invented by A in this earlier application. That's not by another. And that won't be considered prior art. So that may remind you of something we talked about last week, which is uh, the concept of derivation. Look, in order for A to have... Uh, if the court hears this evidence and agrees that A um, that A invented this subject matter and claimed it later, then this application, this A B application, has subject in matter in it that was derived by A's invention, right? Because the of course, A had to invent before it ended up in a patent application, right? And so you would say that it was derived from A, and therefore it's not prior art. Um, now, interestingly, in the case law um, that you're going to read, there are cases where there's even a family claim in here. So this this target is claiming 
priority to an earlier filed family member. Um, and thus you would think that since it's claiming priority, no one would be talking about invalidating it uh, with information by another, but indeed uh, there is a bit of a presumption that's raised here. When you have, an, when you have a different inventive entity, it's considered by another, at least presumptively, you know, presumed to be by another, even if there's a family claim in there, and that it takes, it takes A, uh, providing information or evidence to say, hey, wait a second, that information back in this earlier is not prior art because I'm the one who invented it. And that's kind of the derivation theory. It's also a little bit like um, another theory we learned about last week, um, which is um, proving prior invention. So, look, if A, if A is here and A, B is inventor, the is listed inventors on this, and what now? This is whether or not there's. We'll read in there their cases that they make this determination. Look, it doesn't matter whether or not there's a family claim. If A invented the subject matter in the earlier reference, then it can't be before. Uh, this reference is not before invention because A invented it. So, therefore, it's not. Uh, it's not a, uh, invention by another. Now, uh, as we've talked about, all of this is subject to 102B. If it's more than a year, if this application include more than a year if it published becomes available more than a year before um, the filing before the uh, earliest US filing date of the target then then this it doesn't matter who the information came from under 102b but we're just talking about 102e right now and 102a right and those require require invention by another before the day of invention um, so up here you know, A can also prove, look, I invented it here, right? You know, A and, I, A and B, we f it's true, we filed a pilot application, you know, six months before I filed my later one here. Um, but but even before that, I, A, I had invented the content that went in here. And therefore, my, you know, here's my conception and... Uh, and we'll talk about th that also. But so this concept of derivation all and um, or an earlier invention or swear behind uh, also applies to 102 um, uh, 102e. Now, what does that mean? It means that when you find a reference that has overlapping inventorship, the inf more information. It doesn't matter which of these cases. If there's overlapping inventorship, you need more information that's not going to be available to a patent analyst who's just doing a search, right? And so this is just an issue then that you point out. You don't want to try to map one of these references uh, until you figure, it, you know, you just give the information to the lawyer and let them decide what to do with it once you've, once you've identified this overlapping in inventorship issue. You don't want to just map this reference uh, and say, "Look, it's by another," and uh, therefore, and until the other side proves that it's, you know, earlier conception or derivation, then we have a good reference here. It's not a good position to go into to send your lawyer into a meeting with a reference where, uh, as your best reference, mapping, and they're the only one who knows whether or not they can swear behind that reference. It's a bad position to put your lawyer in, so you don't want to map those. Uh, that's the overall overriding thing until you talk to the lawyer and get their opinion on it. So um, enjoy this week's uh, reading. We'll I'll ch I'll chat with you in class. Thanks.